Welcome to the third lecture on Immanuel critiques, critique of pure, Immanuel Kant's <laughs> critique of pure reason. You can see I'm a little bit verstimmelt. It, for those of you who are watching this somewhere in Russia or wherever on YouTube, it rained very heavily this morning and I had doubts that anybody would show up for this lecture, but there is a hearty band here for which I am very grateful. I have all sorts of things to say about the transcendental aesthetic, which is a, the first serious part of the critique that we come to. But before I do that, you'll recall last, in the last lecture, that Prof Professor Alan Nelson asked a question. And because I thought that his voice wouldn't be picked up satisfactorily on my la lapel mic, I asked him it, whether he would write a few sentences stating the question so that I could respond to it. And he very kindly did. Then I watched the, U the video and discovered that the mic picked his voice up very nicely indeed. But this gives me an excuse to have a second chance at answering his question since the first shot was not very successful in my humble opinion. So first let me read you what he wrote to me and then I will have a more serious effort at answering it. Professor Nelson wrote, you explained some of Kant's basic terminology, but the explanations involve the term experience, which Kant seems to be using in a proprietary way. The rationalists held that thinking the ideas of pure reason was thinking their objects. Hume at least held that reason collapsed into imagination. So why did Kant think he would get no initial pushback on his characterization of experience as applying discursive concepts to intuitions? Good question. And I think I've got, sorry, I, I usually have my glasses on a thing around my neck, so I just dropped them and forgot that I had taken that off and so they fell on the floor. Uh, but, uh, here we go. I think I have something more of an, of an answer to Professor Nelson's question. It's really two questions. First, with regard to Kant's relation to the preceding rationalists, and second, with regard to his relationship to Hume. Let me take the first one first. I don't obviously know for a fact why Kant thought that he wouldn't get pushback, but I have a hypothesis which makes sense. In 1768, two years before the inaugural dissertation, Kant published a paper which got a fair amount of attention. The title of it is Concerning the Ultimate Foundations of the Differentiation of Regions in Space. And it is written in opposition to Leibniz's doctrine of the identity of indiscernibles. If you recall what I said in my first lecture about Leibniz's theory, on Leibniz's view, if two things in space had all the same internal spatial relations, if they were identical in their internal spatial relations, then they were indistinguishable from one another and they were therefore identical. This is what is meant by the identity of indiscernibles. And Kant published a paper, this paper, in which he presented a counterexample, which he thought refuted Leibniz's claim. His counterexample was a very simple one. He said, consider the left and right human hands. Now suppose for the moment, it's not true of any actual human being, but suppose for a moment that your left and right hands are, as far as their internal spatial relations are concerned, absolutely identical with one another. How do you know that they cannot, that they must be distinguished from one another? Answer, there is nothing you can do to turn your hands around that will make one perfectly merge with the other because they are a left and a right hand. They are distinctive, distinguished from one another even though their internal relations are identical. And that, Kant thought, refuted Leibniz's claim. Let me just uh, expand on Kant's uh, example a little bit with a few, a few things on the board. Suppose you, live, suppose you live in one dimensional space. Some of you may remember long ago a story called Flatland, in, which was a fascinating story about people who live in a two dimensional space, which was intended to illustrate the topology of two dimensional space and its difference from three dimensional space. Suppose that you live in one dimensional space. That is, you live in a line and you can't get outside the line. Well, consider the following two objects in one-dimensional space.
assume that I've drawn them so that they're point for point identical, except, of course, that they have different orientations. There is no way in one dimensional space that you can make this object superimpose on this object. You can do it easily enough, of course, you just rotate it around. But to do that, you need two dimensional space. In one dimensional space, you can't do it. Now, suppose to take a second example, that you do the same thing in two dimensional space. So, for example, you have a triangle in two-dimensional space. Don't tell me this is giving out. I've only just started using it. Like this. And then you've got one here that is the other way. No matter what you do in two-dimensional space, no matter how you rotate them around, you cannot make one superimpose on the other. In order to do so, of course, what you have to do is flip it over. But to do that, you have to be in three-dimensional space. Well, Kant didn't have the concept of four-dimensional space, but we do. So we understand the way in which you make two human hands superimposable is to rotate them in fourth-dimensional space. But you can't do it in third-dimensional space, in three-dimensional space. And Kant had the wit to recognize this fundamental fact. And he thought it explained why no amount of conceptual specification of the internal relations of an object would constitute an identification of the object as the unique individual that you were experiencing, thinking about, or reasoning about. The only way to do that, he thought, was through intuition, through sensibility, through an immediate, through a perceptual experience of a particular thing, the human hand or anything else that you want to mention. That, I think, is why Kant didn't think he would get pushback. He thought he had answered the question. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't all by itself justify the claim that you need conception and sensibility working together to have knowledge. But it explains why he thinks that Leibniz's objection to his view would not stand. As far as Hume is concerned, that's a totally different matter, but a very interesting one. Uh, and here, there's, uh, all I can do is refer you to my first serious published paper, which came out of my doctoral dissertation, <laughs> published now 56 years ago, called, you'll be interested to know, Hume's Theory of Mental Activity came out of my dissertation. Out of the Kant part came my book, Kant's Theory of Mental Activity. Out of the Hume part of the dissertation came an article, Hume's Theory of Mental Activity. What I argued there, and I, this is not the subject of these lectures, so I don't, won't go into it at great length. What I argued there was that Hume sought to give an account of experience purely in terms of perception, sensibility, plus rearrangements of the perceptions uh, through the use of the mind. But that, in fact, he found that he always had to appeal to something that there was really no place for in his philosophy, namely certain innate powers of the mind or propensities. He called them dispositions and propensities. So we have a disposition, for example, to develop a habit of expecting when A and B have been conjoined, or like examples, A, B, A prime, B prime, A double prime, B double prime, where A, A prime, and A double prime are all similar to one another and the same thing for B double prime and B, B, B prime and B double prime, we, have an ex we, have a, we develop an internal mental habit when we see another instance of an A-like thing of expecting and conjuring up an idea of a B-like thing. And that habit, Hume thought, is a, an activity of the mind, a function of the mind, which explains our belief in causation, our belief in the existence of independent objects, and all sorts of other things. Now, why is it that we develop these habits, but other creatures do not? Answer, because we have a propensity to develop habits of this sort. A propensity is a second-order disposition. It is, so to speak, a disposition to develop a disposition. And I argued in this paper, I think with some plausibility, 
that these propensities and dispositions in Hume's philosophy function in the argument in very much the same way that concepts and categories function in Kant's argument. Categories are second order rules for forming first order rules which are called concepts. Propensities are second order this, uh, uh, second order functions of the mind for developing first order dispositions which then explain such things as our belief in causal inference. Uh, now, Kant did not know all of that about Hume. He had not read enough of the treatise to be able to infer all of that, and of course he had, he was fatally incapable of reading my paper on the subject since it was published several hundred years after he lived. But had he read it, I think he would immediately have said, aha, yes, I don't know who this guy Wolf is, but he's got his finger on something. So that's more or less a fuller answer. And I will move on without asking Professor Nelson whether that answers his question, because I'm almost certain that it doesn't satisfactorily answer it, and I don't want to get bogged down. But that's more than I said. Now let's move on to the treatise itself. And today we come, remember where we are. I did all that number on the principles of organization of the critique. We are going to talk today about the transcendental aesthetic, which is the first part of the doctrine of elements, the other part is the transcendental logic, and all of that is the first part of the critique, the doctrine of elements, the second part being the doctrine of method. So this is the transcendental aesthetic. It's quite short, as you will have noticed. You read the whole thing for one day, whereas the, the transcendental logic goes on for most of the book. There's a reason for that. As I think I've already mentioned, Kant thought he had actually solved the major problems with regard to sensibility that he faced in the inaugural dissertation. He didn't think that there was a great deal more to be said. Turns out later on in the book there is some more to be said. But he was fairly happy with what he had said, and so he just lays it out and doesn't spend a lot of time talking about it. He's really eager to get on to the transcendental logic where the heavy duty stuff appears. Remember that Kant had sought in the inaugural dissertation a compromise between the rationalists and the empiricists. And this compromise involved saying that the rationalists were correct about things as they were in themselves, the empiricists were correct about things as appearances, the rationalists used reason to grasp the nature of things in themselves, the empiricists used sensibility or perception to grasp the nature of things as appearances. So that fundamental distinction was laid down already in the inaugural dissertation, and he carried it over into the critique, with the exception that he gave up the claim that reason could give us knowledge of things in themselves, and instead transferred the role of reason to the realm of appearances, where he argued that one needed both, uh, both uh, sensi sensibility and understanding, both reason and intuition, in order to gain knowledge. Uh, now, let's actually take a look at the text. I want to start with the very first page. Uh, Kant starts, in whatever manner and by whatever means a mode of knowledge may relate to objects, intuition is that through which it is in immediate relation to them and to which all thought as a means is directed. I have to tell you, just this is a purely personal observation about myself. This book, I've been living with this book most of my life, and reading passages like this has something the same effect on me as the effect on a little child who is upset at bedtime and whose parents starts telling a story which starts, once upon a time in a, in a forest there lived a little boy or a little girl. I feel such a sense of peace when I read the, that sentence. It's got nothing to do with philosophy, it just has to do with the fact that I've been living with this text all my life. And those of you who are students, I hope, instead of reading nothing but the latest article that appears in the latest journal, I hope there will be certain texts that you come to know so well that later in life, and there will be times when you are stressed, you can return to these texts and take comfort from reading those, fa those familiar passages. At any rate, he goes on. But intuition takes place only insofar as the object is given to us. This again is only possible to man at least, insofar as the mind is affected in a certain way. 
the capacity receptivity for receiving representations through the mode in which we are, we are affected by objects is entitled sensibility. Objects are given to us by means of sensibility, and it alone yields us intuitions. They are thought through the understanding, and from the understanding arise concepts, and so forth, and so on. Now, the first distinction we get is a distinction between passive intuition and active intuition. Intuition is described by Kant as our capacity for being affected by objects, for being our sight, our, our taste, our, our hearing, our physical uh, kinesthetic sensations. Objects affect us and we then have perceptions, we have sensations which appear in the organized in space and time. We'll get to that in a moment. But Kant also thinks that it is at least logically possible that there should be a different kind of intuition, an active intuition. It, active intuition is intuition which is immediate relation to an individual thing, but it is active, not passive. That is to say, it is creative. Through this immediate relation, and a mind possessed of active intuition would create its object, not merely perceive its object when that object affects it. Now, who has active intuition? None of us. But according to Kant, God has active intuition. This is a view, by the way, that's also held by Spinoza in a somewhat different view. It wasn't original with Kant. It was an old view. And I wanted to illustrate this for you. I was originally going to play you a little bit of a Handel aria, and then I decided that was a bit over the top. But I will read you the first stanza of the aria and then explain why I'm reading it. This is a, some, something of a reach, but it's one of my favorite arias. This is an, is an aria from the, from the opera Semele by Handel. And in that opera, if you know it at all, what happens is that a young, beautiful, but rather silly woman named Semele is taken as a lover by the god Jupiter. Semele gets it into her head that she doesn't want to see Jupiter in his human form, which is how he appears to her. She wants to see him as he is in himself. Jupiter demurs because he knows that if he shows himself to her as he is in himself, it will destroy her, as in fact it does later on in the, in the opera. She insists and he does and she's burned to a crisp by the experience. But at this point, he's trying to distract her. So he sings an aria. He's a tenor, by the way. Uh, one of the weird things about Baroque operas is that all the real heavyweights have high voices, not low voices. Sometimes they're counter tenors. In this case, he's a tenor. And he, he sings an aria, a beautiful, beautiful aria called Where'er You Walk. The first verse of which is, Where'er you walk, cool gales shall fan the glade. Trees where you sit shall crowd into a shade. He's trying to distract her from her desire to see him as he is in himself by presenting her with earthly delights. Now, the crucial thing about this, this is a reach. This is not what Handel thought, but this is me seeking to bring something cultural into these lectures by a reach. When Jupiter sings, where'er you walk, cool gale shall fan the glade, he is not predicting that this will happen. He's not describing that she, it's so she can imagine it. He is, by his saying it, creating it. Because he, has, because he has intellectual intuition, because he is omnipotent, because he is God, when he says that, it makes cool gales fan the glade. When he says, trees where you sit shall crowd into a shade, by saying so, he makes it happen. He creates it. That's what it is to have an intellectual intuition, which we don't have. So, so much for that. I was, as I say, I was, I was going to play you the, uh, if it hadn't been raining so heavily this morning, I would have lugged my computer in and played it and it would have been picked up on, on, on. but you can go to YouTube and punch in wherever you walk and you can hear uh, John Mark Ainsley, a wonderful tenor, tenor, singing this aria and it's well worth it, so give it a shot. At any rate, now Kant distinguishes the form from the matter of intuition, of sensibility. The form is intuition, the matter is sensation. The form is space and time, but here he's thinking mostly of space. And the, and the 
the matter or content of the intuition is sensation, the colors, the tastes, the smells, the feels, the sounds, which are the content of our perception. Something very important is going on here, which Kant knew about and didn't talk about because it had long since been an, become an accomplished fact in the science of his day. But it's worth talking about just a bit because it's a very important trans transformation that took place in early modern uh, intellectual and scientific history. For the, about two millennia before the 16th and 17th century, there had been a standard story in Western thought about the nature of the physical universe. There were, according to scientists going all the way back to the time of Aristotle, four elements which you've all heard about, air, fire, earth, and water, or air, fire, water, and earth. There was a fifth element, a pemptaeusia or quintessence, from which the spheres were made, a, a finer, a, a purer element, which was, came to be known as a quintessence, hence the, hence the word quintessence. And that fifth, but the four sublunar elements were air, earth, fire, and water. And from early times, these were associated with four qualities, heat, cold, wetness, and dryness. And in the obvious combinations, fire was conceived of as hot and dry, air was conceived of as hot and moist, water was conceived of as wet and, uh, wet and warm, and earth was, uh, and er wet and cold, and earth was conceived of as cold and dry. And then along with that went a whole elaborate theory about the humors of the body on which medicine was based. There were the four, there were the four humors. There was collar, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And doctors had elaborate theories about how the balance of these in the body produced health, and when they became unbalanced, you were unwell, and the whole problem was to reestablish the balance of these humors. Some of you may be familiar with whole earth uh, Counter, counter medical science today, you know, the people who sell you supplements for lots of money and tell you they'll make you well. That's a modern, a last ditch modern effort to revive this ancient view. And it went along with, th there was an elaborate theory of, the, of, of medicine and of physics which was organized around these notions of hot, cold, wet, and dry, air, earth, fire, and water. Well, <clears throat> Something happened in the 17th century, something that Thomas Kuhn in his famous book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, would later call a, a paradigm shift. What happened was that scientists just stopped talking about wet and dry and hot and cold. They stopped talking about the humors. They started talking only about space and time, distance, velocity, acceleration, impenetrability, uh, gravitational attraction, and all those other properties ceased to be scientifically significant. It wasn't that they got folded into the science, they just dropped out. And that's exactly what Kuhn calls a scientific revolution, a revolution which takes place when a paradigm shift occurs. Have, have any of you, have all of you read The Structure of Scientific Revolutions? It's a book well worth reading. Uh, very briefly, since this is for the ages, I might as well talk about it. What the hell? Uh, Kuhn argues that for much of the time, scientists go on doing what he calls normal science. They go on doing more experiments that are just quite like the experiments that their predecessors had done, giving explanations of new things that are just like the explanations that have been given by their predecessors. And then something happens. Somebody does a new experiment which is dramatically different and which now serves as a new model for how to do science, something called, which he calls a paradigm. There's a lot of misunderstanding among people who read Kuhn about what a paradigm is, so let me just take a word, take a moment to explain the notion. The notion is clearest in the, in the Christian tradition of the imitatio Christi. Uh, if all of you are familiar with your Old and New Testaments, you know that in the Old Testament, God hands down to Moses the law in the form of the two tablets. And that law is God's 
eternal and irrevocable law. In the New Testament, the law becomes, the word becomes flesh. The law is embodied in the perfect man, Jesus Christ. And from then on, Christians, instead of simply following the law, which is a set of prescriptions and proscriptions, mostly proscriptions, it, Christians instead attempt to be as much like Jesus as they can. They imitate Jesus. Jesus becomes the paradigm for perfection. That is an, inst an individual instance of a, of, or model of perfection. And so what you do is try to imitate Christ. You see a, 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 a modern vulgar version of this in the bumper stickers that say WWJD, what would Jesus do? Well, that's a modern version of the imitatio Christi. Instead of asking, what is the right thing to do, you ask, how can I imitate Jesus? How can I be like the Christ? That's what happens in science, says Kuhn. This new experiment is so dramatic that young scientists start imitating that new way of doing scientific experiments. The old guys, it's always guys in those days, the old guys don't change. They just die out. They keep doing their old science, but they don't have young students who want to imitate them because the young students are all hot to do the new thing. You see this in philosophy all the time. And so the old guys who don't have tenure, but if they did, they would last forever, they die out. And pretty soon, there's a new and totally different way of doing science, which is, becomes the new normal science. Now, there's an implication of that, which, again, is of profound importance. And again, I'm not sure that people fully understand this. This is something I learned from my closest friend and late, alas, late friend, Robert Ackerman. I attended a lecture he gave on the history of science and learned this from him and then stole it from him and put it into a textbook I was writing. The classic view, which you find, for example, in Francis Bacon's Novum Organum, is that science is cumulative. And it is cumulative because the observations that scientists make keep building up in a larger and larger pot of observations. And new theories, new hypotheses, new explanations are given. But science accumulates and advances because the old observations are carried along, added to the new observations, and they make a better and better science. Not according to Kuhn. What Kuhn says is, if you look at the actual history of science, there's a whole mass of observations that simply drop out of science. All those observations about hot and cold and warm and dry, about air, earth, fire, and water, all those observations about the four humors of the human body cease to be scientific evidence at all. They don't get folded in, they get dropped out, which has the interesting implication that it's not so obvious that science is cumulative and positively advancing. It just changes. And that, when Kuhn wrote this book and published it in 1962, produced a real revolution in the way people did the philosophy of science and gave rise to a whole lot of interesting new accounts of the way scientific explanations go along. Well, anyway, what Kant is here doing is without, I think, perhaps even that much being conscious of it, echoing and giving philosophical voice to this new paradigm that had come in to existence with Kepler, with uh, Galileo, and of course with Newton. The new physics, which focuses only on spatio-temporal characteristics of things and drops out the sensations. The sensations cease to be cognitively significant. They are the content of perceptions, but they are not uh, that on which scientific uh, explanations are based. Now at this point we come to, oh, let me just add one more point which you will discover when you move past the aesthetic next week and start reading the transcendental logic. In the inaugural dissertation, space was clearly the premier form of intuition and time was kind of like a poor relation, if I may make a very bad pun. Clearly Kant in the inaugural dissertation had in mind Euclidean geometry and had things he wanted to say about its status as being true only of things as appearance, not of things as they are in themselves. That priority of space over time continues in the transcendental aesthetic. 
Thereafter, it gets completely reversed. And for the rest of the transcendental analytic, as you will discover next week and in subsequent weeks, it is time, not space, which is the central form of intuition on which Kant concentrates. So much so that when, at a certain point in the analytic of principles, he, Kant has to return to the subject of geometry and space and in a passage called The Axioms of Intuition, give a new and somewhat better account of the status of mathematical uh, truths. But at this point, he's still focusing on space rather than time. Now, why is it that Kant thinks that the propositions of space are synthetic? That's actually quite interesting and quite important. Uh, this, I, th I think, I don't know the history well enough to be sure, but I think this is new with Kant, this understanding that, that formal Euclidean geometry is a collection of synthetic, not analytic propositions. He's quite insistent about that. Kant had a, a, re had a realization about the nature of Euclidean proofs, which, which implied that the, that the propositions of Euclidean geometry were synthetic. In order to illustrate this, let me just give you a simple example of a Euclidean, <coughs> of a Euclidean uh, argument. I, I went all the way through uh, book one of Euclid's elements, which I have, and couldn't actually find this proposition. So for all I know, it isn't in, it isn't in uh, Euclid's elements, but it should be if it isn't. It's, it's a perfectly straightforward theorem. It goes like this. You, you take, oh great, that doesn't work. All right, panic time. That's nice. Blue. A word about the fact that sensation is unimportant. When you teach geometry to little children, it's hard to keep them focused. So what you do is you color the triangles all red and yellow and blue, and you turn all the circles into happy faces, and you make the squares into SpongeBob SquarePants in order to keep their attention focused. But we all understand that that's not essential to the geometry, and sooner or later they graduate from that to pure triangles. In this case, uh, I'm assuming that some of the people viewing me in the great beyond are a little bit young and immature about these things. So I've made the triangle blue to keep their interest in. But it's not a, a sense. The blueness of the triangle is no part of the proposition. Now let's label this triangle, as you're all familiar with, A, B, C. Those are the three vertices. Now, the proposition is that a line bisect, bisecting the apex bisects the base of an isosceles triangle and is perpendicular to the base. So the first thing you do is you draw the bisector. And you know, because it's an isosceles triangle, this line is equal to this line. You all remember from your childhood how you, how you show that. And this angle is equal to this angle. And this line, since it's identical with itself, is equal to itself. And by a previous theorem, two triangles E, uh, which have the same side angle side are congruent. Since they are congruent, the corresponding third sides are equal, which means that this side is equal to this side. What's more, this angle is equal to this angle. But we know from constructions, an isosceles triangle, that this angle is equal to this angle. And since this angle is equal to this angle because we bisected the angle, we know that this angle is equal to this angle. But because this angle plus this angle equals 180 degrees, it follows that each of these angles is 90 degrees, and that shows that it's perpendicular, OK? That's the proof. It's dead simple. Now a question that Kant thought to ask, but that nobody ever does think to ask. How do you know that the line that bisects the vertex intersects the base? What? Say what? How do you know? Well, look at it. All you have to do is look at it and construct it. You don't have to, you don't have to perform an elaborate induction. You don't have to do this 150 times and calculate the percentage of times that it bisects the base. You can construct it in pure intuition, as Kant says, and you can see that. Give you another, but, but there's nothing in the definitions of Euclid's elements. There's nothing 
in the logic that necessitates that it intersects it. It's part of the construction. I'll give you another example. This is not one that I find in Euclid, but it's just as good. This is one that to modern topologists worry a lot about. You take a point A, you inscribe around this point a circle of radius R. Pick any point outside the circle, which is a, of distance twice R, call it B. Connect A and B. Where, it, where the connecting line crosses the circle, call that C. Now suppose you want to show something. How do you know that the line connecting the point inside the circle with the point outside the circle crosses the line? Well, look at it. You can see that it crosses the line. But that doesn't follow from the definition of point, circle, and line. That follows from the construction. Now, you can reconstruct geometry and, uh, axiomatically in, in, and, and in, in axiomatic topology so that that becomes a theorem that a point outside a line connecting a point inside the line crosses the circle, inside, outside the circle, inside the circle, crosses the circle. But it's not trivially true. It takes a lot of heavy lifting to do that. That's another example. There are every, almost every one of Euclid's theorems, except for a couple which are simply logic chopping, almost every, every significant theorem in Euclid's elements involves a construction. The construction always involves doing something that doesn't follow from the definitions, but which is a construction in pure intuition. That is what Kant is talking about. It is why Kant thinks that all of uh, geometry is a collection of synthetic propositions. Yes? This might not be the time you want to answer this question. It's always the time I okay, want to. Okay, but I mean, you can say that this question we'll deal with later. But, um, so, if that all sounds right, but um, once we realize that we don't get that the line AB has to intersect the circle from um, the concepts, the axioms, the definition, uh, we have to see it, then it becomes clear that it's important that that's just one circle. I'm, I'm having an intuition of one circle, and I see that that line does have to intersect it. Um, so, but, but if geometry has the kind of universality and certainty that Kant wants it to have, then I have to immediately know that every circle would be like that. But yes. It's similarly with the isosceles triangle. Um, different isosceles triangles have different shapes, but, but having done the proof at once, I, I see it once, and now I know somehow that every single time I do it again, I'm going to know. And this is one of the things that's always I've always found puzzling about the transcendental aesthetic. Do you have a view about what Kant would say about that? I mean, it almost looks like you've got to, you've got to do induction. You've got to see a bunch of triangles and then conclude that every single time you see another one, you're going to also be able to see that the line crosses the... I think base. I have some idea of what Kant would say. Whether it would be satisfactory is another question. I am, as you can guess, a defender of Kant, but there are limits. Uh, I'm not prepared to go to the stake for every proposition in the critique, but. I am prepared to do whatever I can to make his views as plausible as possible. And this actually connects up with the next thing I was going to talk about, so it's a good question. I think Kant's answer is something like this. <clears throat> because we construct this in pure intuition, not giving ourselves examples. You don't have to draw something on the board. You don't have to draw something on a piece of paper or in the, in the sand. You simply have to construct it in pure intuition. And because you're doing that, you are abstracting from all of the ways in which isosceles triangles vary from one another. And so long as you only attend in your argument to those features that all isosceles triangles have by virtue of the definition of an isosceles triangle, or all circles have by virtue of the definition of a circle, what you are reasoning must be true for all of them. Now, but, yeah. Okay. But of course, uh, an isosceles triangle can, can be... Yes. There, yes, he's, he's making a move like this. I saw the isosceles triangles can be of many different sorts, infinitely many different sorts. And I have to be forming a pure a priori intuition of a triangle of one of those shapes, I guess, rather than any of the others. I think, okay, let me move on to the okay, subject okay. Of, of pure intuition, which will be an attempt to answer that objection. Okay. 
Kant is ambiguous in a very profound way about the expression pure intuition. Sometimes he uses the phrase pure intuition to mean the pure form of intuition, the purely formal characteristics of intuition. And sometimes, especially when he's talking about geometry, he makes it clear that he thinks that there is a separate manifold of pure intuition, separate from the manifold of perceptions. A second manifold, the word manifold, which I was going to get to in a moment, is, by the way, a very, very problematic word in, Ger in Kant, because in German it clearly means something that in English we've forgotten it means. The German is mannigfaltiger. It's a manyness. A manifold is a manyness. It's what William James in a famous phrase called a buzzing, blooming confusion. A, a manifold is a manyness of a manifold of perceptions is a manyness of perceptions. But when you say a manifold, it sounds like it's already organized into a thing, and that's exactly the wrong way to think about it. And it's very hard to remember that when you're reading the critique. That until Kant talks about the unification of the manifold, the synthesis of the manifold, as he will talk next week, it's it's not legitimate to think that way. Kant thinks not only that we have a manyness of perceptions, the form of which is space and time, he also in many passages thinks, says, that we have a separate collection or manyness of pure intuitions, of relations which are not relations of anything. That's a really mysterious, now it's easy enough to think of it as sort of like ectoplasmic stuff. You know, so, so white, so transparent that it's not really anything. But that's the wrong way to think about it. It's a totality of sets of relations in which he thinks certain truths can be formulated which follow from the nature of the form of, the, of that manifold, but which are not induc induced from, are not derived by induction from an examination of many particular examples. Yeah? Professor Wolf, this is... Uh, this might be related to uh, uh, formulation in the transcendental aesthetic um, that I was wondering about, where Kant says, and I believe the phrase he uses is, um, a form of intuition is a formal intuition. And, and I, I just wanted to understand how that identification, if that is an identification, is supposed to work. What, what he means by saying form of intuition is a formal intuition. That, because the question comes from the back of the room, I'll repeat it because I, it may be that this little mic picks it up. It's, it's stronger than I thought, but anyway. Kant sometimes uses the phrase a formal intuition and sometimes a form of intuition. What's the relationship? Well, the problem, this is precisely the problem. Sometimes by formal intuition, he simply means the formal aspects of a, of a manyness of perceptions. And sometimes he means a separate manifold of pure intuition which has no sensory content whatsoever, but which is simply a, cis, a set, a manyness of spatial relations. Now, I, uh, this is a point at which I've spent a lot of time in my life puzzling over this, and I am not at all persuaded that it, in the end, makes sense. So I'm not going to defend it. I just want to explain what's, as much as I can what's going on and why Kant thought that he needed it. This notion of a manifold of pure intuition among German Kant scholars of the first part of the 20th century gave rise to an elaborate theory about a twofold affection of the self. First, an affection which produces, or impact on the self, which produces this manifold of pure intuition, and then a second affection which produces perceptions. And a German scholar named Erich Adekes wrote a book which I am proud to say when I was a graduate student I read in German. So those of you who know me will realize what an enormously big deal this is for me since even though I'm a Kant scholar my German is wretched. But he wrote a book called uh, Über der Doppelte Affektion unseres Ich on the double affection of ourselves in which he talked about these two set affections and the two manifolds and an elaborate theory of the relationship. I think in the end none of that makes sense. It's a desperate effort 
to make, find a place in the interpretation for everything Kant says. And my own personal view is that it can't be defended. But I, because it comes up, I wanted to make clear what Kant had in mind, what led him to say this puzzling thing about a manifold of pure intuition. And I think it is Kant's recognition that, on his view, geometry is a collection of synthetic propositions which are knowable a priori in a different way from the propositions of physics being known a priori. They are known absolutely a priori, i.e., even without any sensory experience on Kant's view, it would still be possible to do geometry. Yeah? Well, I guess I have two, two questions. In, in the case of the diagram on board, uh, what's the pro is, if the proposition is that there will be a B, a C. Uh, the, the proposition is. No, no you, I want to get to the C. Oh, okay. That there will be a B twice the distance from the center as the radius of the circle. Isn't it then, by reason, A and B will be connected up by a line? Two yes, a but how do you know that that line crosses the circle? Well, well the way you know, how you know that uh, because uh, because how, how do you know the circumference of a? I mean, it, how could it not cross the circle? Exactly. That that's what Kant says. How could it not cross the circle? And yet that it crosses the circle is not something that can be deduced from the definitions and axioms of Euclid's geometry. How could it not? And Kant's answer is, it couldn't not. Clearly, it must cross the circle, but that doesn't follow from, uh, from the axioms and the definitions of Euclid's principles, and that's the problem. Well, the more general point of this, uh, that's great. The, the, the question of this manifold intuition, uh, isn't uh, it isn't what he talk, what he's talking about if you ref, if you confine yourself to geometry is <clears throat> an instantaneous sense of constant ratios an instantaneous i'm not sure i know what instantaneous sense well, of constant it, ratios is you can what you are doing is drawing conclusions from the form of intuition which lies ready in your mind that you are doing well the way in which you would do it is that the form of the intuition uh, has a ratio. It's constructed out of some ratios, is it not? Um, I, conf I confess I don't fully understand what it means to say constructed out of ratios. There are ratios of different lines and so and forth. One has a manifold appreciation. No, no, not manifold, the word manifold isn't used in that way. A manif manifold is a manyness of, of perceptions or a manyness of pure intuitions. It's a collection, a lot of stuff. It's not a thing. Diverse? They might have manifold of perceptions is some are smells, some are tastes, some are views, okay. some are feels. So they're quite diverse. To an extrapolation of, an intu of a single intuition, we're talking about we're talking about manyness is a series of instantaneous. Uh, well, not not, I'm not sure that instantaneous captures what Kant is talking about. But anyway, let me go on. Maybe okay. this will be somewhat clearer. Uh, all right, that was very heavy. I can't resist telling a story. I mean, I, look, I'm 82 years old. If I don't tell my stories now, who's going who's gonna to know them? This is a story which directly relates to the problem of the axiomatization, axiomatization, axiomatization of geometry, and therefore it's a pertinent story. 64 years ago, when I was an 18-year-old senior at Harvard, I started to write my honors thesis. Now, I should explain, 
Harvard in those days required four courses a semester, eight semesters, 32 courses. You pass 32 courses, you get a degree. There was nothing complicated about it. I was going through in three years. I was taking five courses a semester, 10 courses a year, 30 courses. I went to summer school, took two courses in summer, 32. My senior year, I was taking tutorial for credit. The key here is to understand you only got credit for tutorial for credit, two semesters of tutorial for credit, if you wrote a thesis. If you didn't write a thesis, you didn't get credit, and I would only have 30 courses and I wouldn't graduate. Okay. Well, I was a logic student, and for a brief moment in my life, I was a hotshot logic student. So I was assigned to Hao Wang, Willard Van Norman Quine's best student who was an assistant professor. And he was going to be my dissertation director. So I went to see him in the early fall, and I said, sir, what should I write on? Wang was a brilliant logician, but a rather shy man. Didn't actually like to look you straight in the eye. He took off his desk a Rand Corporation monograph written by the great logician Alfred Tarski, whom I talked about called A Decision Method for Elementary Geometry. He said, here, work on this, and sent me home. So I went home and I read it, and it was very hard. Uh, Tarski said it was an extension of Sturm's theorem. No internet in those days, so I went to the library and discovered Sturm's theorem is a theorem about the number of real roots of a polynomial. What did I know? So I worked for a month and I finally understood the damn thing, and I wrote a 10-page summary of Tarski's argument, and I went back to see Professor Wong, and I said, okay, sir, now what do I do? And Wong sort of looked up at a corner of his office and said, put it through in an axiom system and sent me home. And I went home and I sat in my room and I said, put it through in an axiom system. What does put it through mean? Put what through? In what axiom system? I was so embarrassed that I had no idea what I was supposed to do that I didn't go back to ask him. And I think probably, since it sounded like something he could do on a lazy afternoon, he probably would not have understood somebody who couldn't figure out what he was supposed to do. And after about another month or so, I panicked. So I went to see Morton White, who was, I think, as I've mentioned, the one certifiably sane member of the department. And I said, sir, sir, what do I, if I don't get tutorial for credit by doing a thesis, I don't graduate, what do I do? And he calmed me down. He said, now, Bob, you've just been taking my course on analytic philosophy, haven't you? I said, yes, sir. And he said, and we just read Gilbert Ryle's Concept of Mind, didn't we? I said, yes, sir. He said, write a thesis on Concept of Mind. Well, that I knew how to do. So I went home and I banged out 54 forgettable pages on Concept of Mind, and I got tutorial for credit, and I graduated. And that was my, the end of my career as a logician. And then, first, uh, this, the rest of it is the rake's progress. I mean, first I started doing the history of philosophy, which in those days meant I was significantly inferior to a logician. And then, as though that weren't bad enough, I started doing political philosophy. I mean, I might just as well have been out on the street hustling used, used iPhones. It was, I mean, that, doing political philosophy meant I was never going to be a serious human being. Willard Van Orman Quine stopped talking to me. And I, that's my, la my last moment when I had a chance at being somebody, as, as, as Marlon Brando says in On the Waterfront. I could have been a contender, but I just, I, and I still don't know what the hell I was supposed to do with, with uh, but apparently I, I could have, if I'd known what to do, I could have produced an axiomatized decision method for elementary geometry, which, which would answer all of these questions. Anyway, <coughs> anyway. At this point, I want to call your attention to what is, in some ways, one of the most fascinating and underappreciated passages in the transcendental aesthetic. This is a passage at A27, and it's very short. Kant says, we can indeed say that space comprehends all things that appear to us as external, but not all things in themselves by whatever subject they are intuited, or whether they be intuited or not. For we cannot judge in regard to the intuitions of other thinking beings whether they are bound by the same conditions as those which limit our intuition and which for us are universally valid. We cannot judge in regard to the intuition of other thinking beings. In a throwaway line, Kant considers the possibility that there are other non 
divine beings somewhere in the universe who have different forms of intuition and for whom therefore Euclidean geometry would not be valid. He doesn't say any more about that and it raises a fascinating question. It raises a question that nobody, now this is one of those weird things about the history of thought. It raises a question that nobody in the 18th century ever thought about, so far as I can figure out, and that everybody in the 19th century thought about all the time. Namely, never mind other thinking beings, never mind ETs or aliens, is it possible that our forms of intuition are culturally encoded? Is it possible that some human beings have one system of intuition and other human beings have another system of intuition? This is something that it never crossed Kant's mind to consider. And yet once you start considering it, all sorts of possibilities open up. I will just remind you, if, if there's anybody out there who actually watched my lectures on ideological critique, only a handful, but still there might be somebody, I talked for a while about Karl Mannheim's ideology and utopia. And in ideology and utopia, Mannheim, writing in the early 20th century, does something extraordinary. He argues that our experience of spatial relations itself is ideologically encoded. That liberals and conservatives and radicals experience space itself differently from one another. And then what I did just as a jeu d'esprit in my lectures, since Mannheim didn't think to, to bother to do it, was to generate a whole story about the different ways in which liberals and conservatives and radicals experience time relations as well as spatial relations. Now, if it is possible, if it is possible that different human beings experience space and time differently from other human beings, then that seems to drive Kant into a solipsistic position in which what he is saying is true of, let us say, himself, and if he's lucky, one of his readers, but not necessarily true of all human beings as such. And that is a, a possibility that is already implicit in the extreme solipsistic starting point of Descartes' meditations. It's a possibility which lies below the surface but always present in early modern philosophy. What happens if human beings have different forms of intuition? Now that is not something that Kant ever thought about and ever wrote about. But as I say, for example, is it possible not that individuals at a given time have different forms of intuition, but that the forms of intuition evolve historically or develop historically, that they are related to different stages in human history. Again, something that lots of people in the 19th century thought about, but that nobody in the 18th century seems to have thought about. It's, it, if you're looking for a doctoral dissertation, it's a fascinating one to be written on this subject, and I just throw it out to you. Okay. We come, I'm not going to go through the particular arguments in the aesthetics since they're not really terribly interesting. All these four arguments about space and these four arguments about time. I mean, anybody can make something out of anything and I'm sure there's a lot to be said, but I don't have anything to say about them. So I'll just move on to the general observations because there are some very interesting things going on in the general observations. Uh, first of all, take a look at general observation two which really is historically and philosophically very important. In general observations were added, these general observations were added in the second edition, by the way, an important fact. Kant says at uh, B6869, there is no corresponding page in A because this was added in the second edition. He says, if the faculty of coming to consciousness of oneself is to seek out, to apprehend that which lies in the mind, it must affect the mind, and only in this way can it give rise to an intuition of itself. But the form of this intuition, which exists antecedently in the mind, determines in the representation of time the mode in which the manifold is together in the mind, since it then intuits itself as it would represent itself if immediately self-active, not as it would represent itself if immediately self-active, but as it is affected by itself and therefore as it appears to itself, not as it, not as it is. Now, when you read that passage, it's very easy to suppose 
that what you've got here is one of these complicated Escher-like puzzles that's collapsing on itself. It feels as though the sentence collapses on itself until it's about nothing at all. But it's actually about something very important, and it is Kant's answer to Descartes. What Kant is saying, it would be easy to suppose if you were living in the 18th century and you were familiar with Descartes and you then read the critique and got this far, it would be easy to suppose that Kant was saying that our spatial, the form of spatial intuition lies ready in the mind, but that of course the mind knows itself as it is in itself because it immediately is conscious of itself or present to itself. So therefore, although our knowledge of outer things is only a knowledge of things as they appear to us, a knowledge of appearances, our knowledge of the self itself, or my knowledge of myself, is of a different sort because I am immediately aware of myself. And that would create an imbalance, a, an epistemological imbalance between our knowledge of appearances and our knowledge of the self, which would be a knowledge of the self as thing in itself not as mere appearance. And that's what Kant wants to deny. So he here says that even when I am thinking about myself, as Descartes is when he says cogito, I think, even when I am thinking about myself, what is happening is that my thought affects itself and so that the diversity of representations of myself that I then experience I experience in the form of time. Not as I am in myself, but as I appear to myself in time. But as a thing in itself, I do not exist in time. Time is only the way in which I appear to myself. Which means, and again, this is in an interesting way an echo of something that Spinoza had said much earlier. My knowledge of myself is on an epistemological par with my knowledge of outer things. Both my knowledge of outer things and my knowledge of myself are not, is knowledge only as things appear to me, not as they are in themselves. And therefore, Descartes is wrong in thinking through, that through in, inner self-understanding, he arrives at an absolutely undeniable knowledge of independent reality, namely the reality of himself. It's crucial to Kant's philosophy to say this. He says it, as I say, in a very convoluted way. I'll read that passage again. It's not exact, doesn't exactly leap off the page as something obvious. He says, since it, the self, then intuits itself, not as it would represent itself if immediately self-active, but, but as it is affected by itself, and therefore as it appears to itself, not as it is. That's a crucial, crucial passage. And later on we will see in the, in the Transcendental Analytic, we will say that, see that it plays an absolutely central role in the argument that Kant finally constructs to demonstrate the law, the, the causal law, and many other things besides. But I wanted to call attention to that passage. We can think about it and come back to it and talk about it some more, because it's a very, a very important idea. Along with this, in general observation three, I want to say something, this, uh, this has been sort of heavy, so I'll bring myself to a close here. I want to say something about a certain set of distinctions that Kant introduces, which are again crucial to his argument, and crucial to ex replying to those who think that he is just a Barclayan idealist, which is the way in which he was interpreted when the book was first read. We don't tend to think of him that way now because we look at him looking backwards in time. But the people reading the book at the time who are familiar with Barclay and Hume and Locke and Leibniz and Descartes, it looked as though Kant was just embracing a Barclay and idealism, saying there's nothing but our knowledge of the self, a sort of solipsism of the present moment, as it were. Kant draws a distinction, first of all, between the transcendently real, which he persists in calling the transcendently real, I'm sorry, I told you that he does this all the time, but he shouldn't. He, he dis distinguishes between the transcend transcendently real, which Leibniz since he thinks he has knowledge of in the monadology, but which Kant denies we can ever have knowledge of. That's things as they are in themselves. And the transcend transcendently ideal, which is this realm of appearance. 
The realm of appearance is transcendently ideal because it is merely a realm of appearance, not a realm of things in themselves. Within the transcendently ideal, there is another distinction, the familiar distinction between appearance and reality, between what is empirically ideal and what is empirically real. What does Kant have in mind? Well, ordinary things. You go wandering in the desert, looking for an oasis, and after a while you have a mirage. I'm, I've never wandered in a desert, so I don't know whether this is true. The only time I've been in a desert, I was being driven around in a combi by a guide who was showing me animals, and I was well hydrated, and therefore I never had mirages. But apparently, if you wander long enough in the desert, in the distance you see something which you mistakenly think is an oasis, but it's actually a mirage. That's transcendently, that's transcendently ideal. It's not real, it's just an idea in your mind. That's to be distinguished from, a, from an oasis, which is, which is empirically real. The, the mirage is empirically ideal. The oasis is empirically real. It's a real oasis, and if you make it to it, you can drink water and you'll stop being so dehydrated. Same sort of thing, you all know this, I assume, maybe as, a, as children you did it. If you take a straight stick and you stick it at an angle into water, it looks bent. It looks bent because the angle of refraction of air is different from the angle of refraction of water. It's the same reason why the sun low in the sky looks larger than the sun high in the sky. Now you know that the sun is the same size low in the sky as it is high in the sky. You know that the stick is really straight even though it looks bent. The, the bentness of the stick is empirically ideal. It's a mere appearance in the empirical world. Whereas the straightness of the stick is empirically real. Same thing with the sun, same thing with a, with a, uh, a rainbow. A rainbow is empirically ideal, whereas the actual droplets of water are empirically real. That distinction, Kant thinks, is a perfectly ordinary, valid distinction which we draw within this experience in all the normal ways. Kant doesn't have a new theory about how to tell that a stick is really straight when it's, it looks bent. The way you do that is to take the stick out of the water and look at it, and you'll see that it's straight. Then you stick it in, then you feel it with your hand, and it feels straight even though it looks bent. I mean, all the usual things you would do, Kant would do. That distinction will play an important role, we will see, in the second analogy, when he distinct, when he, that's the place where the argument finally is brought to a conclusion and the causal maxim is finally proved in all its glory. That ordinary distinction is a legitimate distinction. And to those who say to Kant, but then you're just a Barclay and idealist, he says, no, I'm not. I distinguish between the empirically ideal and the empirically real. And if someone says in response, yeah, sure, but all of that is just transcendently ideal. Where's the real reality? And Kant's answer is, I drew the distinction the only way it can be drawn in our experience. What more do you want? If you can tell me what more you want, then maybe I can give it to you, but you can't, because you can't give me a description of the transcendently real and say, that shows that all you're talking about is something that's not real. All the reality you ever had, all the reality you ever thought you had, is alive in my philosophy. And all the illusions and mirages that you th and rainbows that you thought you had are still there in my philosophy. The distinction between reality and appearance is completely explainable in my philosophy. The only thing that isn't is these transcendent illusions, or if you wish, transcendental illusions, epistemological illusions that people like Leibniz have, that they can give us knowledge of the independently real. That's what is trans epistemologically illusory. It is epistemologically illusory to think that you can have knowledge of transcendent reality. That is what I am showing you. But the familiar distinction never disappears. Pardon me? Doesn't it go far further in saying not only that it's elusive, but impossible? Yes, it's impossible. It's, it's an illusion. We'll talk, well, if I ever get to the dialectic, which if people don't completely disappear, I might actually lecture on next semester, but there's a limit to how much as somebody except like me. You know, I mean, there are some people who are so, fan, so fanatic about poodles that they'll spend a year thinking about poodles. Not everybody is interested in poodles enough to spend more than an hour or so on poodles. I'm fanatic about Kant, so I'd be happy to lecture on Kant for the next three years. But there's a limit to how much people would put up with that. I can't imagine why, but there it is. All right. I actually managed to get through what I wanted to say about 
the aesthetic. The reading for next time is the first part of the analytic of concepts. It is from A50 to A95. In short, the transcendental logic up to, but not including, the transcendental deduction in A. That's the place where we're finally going to get the functions of unity and judgment and the categories, and we will be introduced for the first time to the central concept in Kant's philosophy, synthesis. All of that comes up next week. And now I will see all of you next week, I hope.